What do you guys think? So, in order to figure out what is going on, you have to look at the situation. Like I said, you have to look at it and think about the situation and see if it's unexpected. You have a four client, right? Four client. You have to be sharp about it. They are in the pediatric clinic. First one, projectile nonbilious emesis, and the BUN of that. You have to be sharp, like I said. The projectile nonbilious emesis, this is pyloric stenosis, right? And your BUN 30, of course, is dehydration, right? Episodic abdominal pain and liquid stool with blood. What do you think? This is an intersusception, right? Right lower quadrant pain, big penis point and temperature of that, 101. This is appendicitis. And you have bilious emesis, abdominal distension, distension and bikini, right? This is Ashcron. After you make the diagnosis, ask yourself, who is the most prioritized patient? You have to be sharp. Who has a breathing problem? Anybody know? Electrolyte? No. Shock sepsis? Yes, there's a bunch of sepsis, right? Dehydration, you probably go in shock, right? Appendicitis may have sepsis. Ash prone may have a problem, right? But who do you think is more serious? Intersusception or appendicitis or dehydration, ash prone? Think about the situation. You have to think about it. You got to think about what is happening to this patient. The most serious patient is ash, uh, um, intersusception. If you have interception, interception the, you have telescoping of the bowel. This is an ischemia. If you don't do anything about it quickly, the bowel is going to die. You have ischemia. And they will have a problem. Dehydration, we can give this patient fluid right away. Appendicitis, you don't have to operate on them immediately. There's nothing worrisome about this. It's a diagnosis of appendicitis. The kid has appendicitis. You have like six hours to operate on it. This patient is prone. You put the NG tube in and later on, you go to surgery and get a colostomy. But this, you have to reduce the telescoping of the bowel. Otherwise the kid will go, will have ischemia. So that's the patient you see. And like you said, there's no ABC, there's nothing. They teach you to do ABC, do this, do this, all this acronym. Look, you have to be smart and be sharp about what you're seeing, a dehydration patient, an interception, an appendicitis, and an ash prone. A bunch of them are expected finding, but that number two is a patient you should see. And that's your priority patient right there. So that's number one. And that's your prioritization. And this is how you go about prioritizing your patient as much as possible, flawlessly. Um, you can use anything you want, you want, but just make sure you understand the concept about what you're dealing with and how this patient is being treated. If you do that, this will become easy, right? This will become easy problem without any issue. Right. So that is the first thing. The next one is this. You have four clients. I guess there's five of them. Five clients, right? You have five clients on the neural ward, right? Five, five clients who need immediate intervention. One patient has a GCS of all of them, GCS of nine. Temperature 98, respiratory of 18, systolic blood pressure of 85, SAT 89, and a heart rate of 105. Who do you think need immediate uh, intervention? It's a selected apply. So you don't have to pick all of them, but those that you know, you can pick them. Who should be somebody you should see? 
This is the key concept. And you have to pick each of them. You have to know what is wrong with them, what is going on, and how you're going to apply with it. So this is something you have to know, and you have to know the disease process, right? So what do you have? What do you guys think? I'm looking at your answers. And so we will go through them and see, right? A client with GCS of nine, they all have a GCS. The key concept that I want you to memorize when you answer your question is the concept is when you have brain injury, there's only two things you should worry about, right? Two things, the biggest thing you should worry about is the blood pressure and your yeah, saturation. After that, the rest, you can have temperature, you know? Temperature can also, when the temperatures go up, it become up metabolic. But these are the two things that you worry about. Make sure the blood pressure is normal. Make sure you, the saturation is normal to prevent secondary brain injury. So which one do you think is more worrisome, right? A systolic blood pressure of 89 and a saturation of 80, um, 85 and saturation of 89 are the most important one that you should worry about. This temperature 98 is normal, right? Respiratory of 18 is fine. It's slightly tachycardic. Um, it's not that bad, but the most important is the blood pressure and temperature. Anybody who have a head injury, blood pressure and saturation. This will prevent secondary brain injury. So you want to prevent secondary brain injury. So those are the one we should pick. So three and four are our right answers. The rest are all fine. But don't over-select in your exams. Don't over-select too much. When you over-select, then you get into trouble. Don't over-select, okay? This is another case that is full of concept, right? Four clients on the med surgery unit. You got to pick one answer for this. Who need immediate intervention? A client with anorexia who purged three times this morning. A client with anorexia whose heart rate is now 50. A client with anorexia who refused what? Lunch and dinner. And a client with anorexia who has plus three uh, edema. Like I have said before, you have to be sharp and not an expected finding. Look at a situation, see if this is what I expect. Does this surprise me? An anorexia patient who perked three times, does this surprise me? An anorexia patient whose heart rate is 50, is it what I expect in that patient? Then if not, they have to be sharp. I have to be sharp. I have to make sure it's not a breathing problem, electrolyte shock, sepsis, airway, lethargy, and pain. If you refuse to eat, is it something that I expect? And if I see plus three edema, is it that's what I expect? If that's what you know, then stick with it. If you know, then it's a problem, right? So what do you think? What are your answers? So which one is surprising you most? Which one is not surprising you most? And there's a lot of concept. I hide the answer because I want you to think about the disease process and think about it. You know, when you pick an answer choice, don't just pick it, look at it and say, hey, is this what I expect in this situation? Then if not, then you got to worry about it. Number one, they're going to purge all the time. So it's, is purging is something big for anorexia? It's, yeah, it's something they do. This is not a problem for them. They do it all the time. Of course, it's going to get dehydrated, but that's not, there's nothing. It's not surprising me that anorexia patient purge three times. That's what they do all the time. Are you surprised they're bradycardia? No, their heart rate is always bradycardic. That's where they live. That's why they're more sick, they're sick because they have dehydration, the heart rate is low, 
their temperature is even low. Temperature is never normal. It's in the low side. So this one, don't worry about it. Anorexia patient, do you think he's going to eat for you? No, he refused to eat. I don't care about it. It's not surprising me that much. But anorexia patient with edema, you didn't supposed to have edema. This is critical thinking and concept. So if you want to master that, I think you should sign up for our review that is coming up because I will teach you this. When you see this, you say, oh, this is a problem. They never become, have edema. If you have plus three edema, you have CHF, most likely. And how did this happen? It's when you feed them. When you feed them, they retain fluid, right? Because they're going to read feeding syndrome. You start to feed them quickly, and then they go into uh, uh, heart failure. They retain too much fluid and respiratory failure because their potassium go down, phosphorus go down, magnesium go down, and this is a refeeding syndrome. Anorexic patient with edema is a problem. You're going to CHF. And that is a refeeding syndrome. And so this is a priority. Okay, this is a priority. This is me hiding the answer choice for you to think about. But that is the right answer. Like I said, look at the question and see if this is an expected finding. If it's not, then let it go. Okay, don't worry about it. If it is, then don't worry about it. Number four, and this has become aware of the following client situation. It will be a priority to follow up with who? Who are you going to follow up with? The client with angina pectoralis, and then they give him some beta blocker. The heart failure, some beta blocker. As an MI, some beta blocker. A second degree heart block and describe a neutral Look at the situation, look at the problem, and you have to be sharp when you select the answer choice. Who surprises more? Which situation your antenna should be going up? Which situation your antenna should be going up? All of them is not the best situation. I intentionally create these questions to let them think, you know, they all taking the same medication. They all have bad problem. Whose problem is the worst? Okay. Whose problem is the worst? That is all. That's what B sharp is about. Who, whose problem is the worst? And you have one second, right? I feel my patient, build a blocker is not good for them, but we use it for them. It help remodeling, right? If you have yeah, angina pectoralis, I mean, the other blocker will decrease the oxygen demand of the heart and improve the function, right? The same thing. Heart, if you have MI, you do the same thing to help your heart to heal, to slow you down so that you go over and set yourself. But all of them can have side effect on the individual problem. You know, it can depress the heart function. But these guys already have a heart block you're going to push them in the third degree heart block and they will get a complete heart block. So it's more dangerous. That is the way you think when you're selecting answer choice for prioritization. Forget about all those fancy things they tell you. Think about who you have one second and if you don't do, that patient dies. Patient with the heart block, with a bit of work, is going to go to complete heart block. He, he has no chance compared to the other ones. The other ones we use better blocker to treat them all the time. So you should not surprise you. And this one, another one, classic question. And this has become aware of the following client situation. It will be a priority to follow up which client who had what? You had TERP, transurethral resection of the prostate two days ago. And there's uh, some clot in your foley two days ago. Yeah, it's probably laparotomy um, five hours ago. And then um, you have what? Incisional pain, right? 
and you have T3 spine, uh, spinal cord injury, and now you're diaphoretic, you have headache, you have a laminectomy two days ago, and your feet are still numb. What do you want to do about this patient? What do you want to do about this patient? What do you want to do about this patient? What do you think? Who is more dangerous? Who has no chance at all? Like I said, prioritization is not supposed to be that intimidating if you know your concept. You look at the situation and you said, hey, is this surprising me? I have to be sharp. I have one second, right? Transurethral resection of the prostate. What are you supposed to do? Within 48 hours, there's still some clout in it. It's not that bad. There's nothing in the question telling you I said the patient in shock or not. Clot here does not mean it's bleeding. So you cancel then the bleeding portion, shocks. It's not patient, it's not in shock. As proactive laparotomy, you open the abdomen. They complain of severe pain, incisional, right? Your incision is going to hurt. It's not a problem. Spine injury above T6, and he's sweaty, and he has headache. This is an ICP issue. Right? Autonomic dysreflexia. You want this patient to be fine? Yeah, you be the judge. Laminectomy, I fixed the spine, you know, basically in the lamina, and I fixed it because probably you have sciatica. Well, you're not going to, you still are going to be numb for two days. It's take a while for you to recover from it. This is not a neurological problem. It's a side effect of the surgery. Slowly, you're going to recover. So who is more dangerous? Somebody with the ICP issue. It's more dangerous. It has autonomic dysreflex, yeah. And you have to figure, figure it out. But this is what I try to teach you guys. Try to like, don't forget about those fancy thing they tell you. Make a diagnosis and then say, oh, this is an asthma patient. This is it. And is this thing, it's what I see in them. If I see in them, then I'm moving on. I'm looking for somebody I don't see something abnormal, and then I pick as my answer choice. Okay. Same thing, classic, right? The nurse has become aware of the following client. It will be a priority to follow up with who? A COPD patient is using Perslip when he's breathing. And when he's walking, then you have a GBS, Grand Beret syndrome patient, his lung capacity, vital capacity is about two hours ago, has increased. Somebody out, hysterectomy, total abdominal hysterectomy, 12 hours ago, and he's saturating, what, one part in six hours. This is the language NCLA has been using to deceive you. So I'm trying to use it so that become comfortable, but you see, the B sharp is all buzzwords. I'm looking for the buzzwords in the question. Pericardite is buzzwords. I see systolic blood pressure uh, and dropping what? Um, 20 minute higher during expiration than inspiration. Hey, I know something is not right, right? I look at both of them. What is going on? What, is, what am I going to see, see? What am I trying to see? You just have to seek and see. The answer choice is right in front of you and it does not make sense. And when you see it, you can figure it out that look for the password, COPD patient, what do I see him? He's using per slip. Oh, I want you to do that when you walk so that you don't get shortness of breath. GBS patient, I know it's going to affect your lung. But what? There's an increase in vital capacity. The lung capacity is improving in two hours ago. It's a good thing. You have hysterectomy. I know you're going to bleed 12 hours ago, but how? You saturate one part in six hours, you're good. The one you worry about 15, 
15 minutes, less than an hour, saturating the pad. Hey, yeah, that's a bleeding problem in your B sharp. It becomes a shock. There's no shock problem here. Pericarditis patient, the systolic blood pressure is changing. This is, we call it pulsus paradoxical. It's a sign of cardiac tamponade. Are they going to tell you that? No, they want you to know all the features so that when they put it together, you, 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 you can figure out this patient is in cardiac tamponade. When you see pericarditis, the only thing that is expected is what? Chest pain that get relieved when you lean forward. Anything they give you, most likely they'll give you signs and symptoms of tamponade, which is what? Narrow pulse pressure, JVD, blood pressure is low, pulse is paradoxical. Those things you have to know about it, the cardiac tamponade symptoms. But if they tell you patient has chest pain, when he lean forward and it gets better for pericarditis, forget about it, move on. So number four is your the friend, is the right answer. So don't worry about it. But like you said, this is the way I do my prioritization. Um, you have to look at a situation first. And this is a trappy question. I want you to think. I'm doing these questions. I think I've done it before, but these, these questions, when I said them that time, to let you think like, we all have the same thing in common, okay? Then you move to the next step. What do I worry about? The, the, the way you do it is to divide it into two. Okay, this is the best way to do prioritization. Divide it into two. Look at a situation, two day old. You have sore throat, right? What is the problem? You have sore throat. You're going to have fever. But what is causing the fever? Running nose? Yeah, I don't know. The same two day old, sore throat, you have fever. Okay, what is causing it? Backing cough, two day old, throat, the same temperature, and you have atriagia, two day old, the same temperature, and you are in the tripod position. Which of these make you look at that patient twice? That means you are being sharp. That's what it means. So which of these make you look at it twice? Which of these make you look at it twice? And you can make a diagnosis. Two day old, this probably this has RSV infection, right? And then and we have crop here, you know? And then this is like upper respiratory infection. And this look like epigrotitis. Who is more dangerous? You be the judge. Right? You have a crop, RSV, UR symptoms, and epigrotitis you know four is dangerous. He has no chance. So he's the one we got to figure out as soon as possible. Otherwise, he's going to get sick. So this is what I want you guys to pay attention to, okay? When you're doing prioritization, when you're doing it, if you've seen this question before, it's, I just want you to keep on thinking about it as you, you, don't, you master it. There's nothing wrong doing it. Mastering this, when you go to your end classes, the bulk of the test is all prioritization. For all clients in the pit world, right? Who need immediate intervention? This is, question is all like concept. It is like a bunch of concept I use it to create it. These are all created by me. Um, it's all created by me, so um, this, if you have question, yeah, somebody have a question. I'll, um, so, It's a bunch of um, concept, and I'll explain it to you. Like I said, divide it into two, okay? And look at the situation, always divide it. Look at the situation, and then what is the cause? What is happening? I'm her immunoglobulin for a four-year-old. He has Kawasaki. I'm giving IV aromorphine for a sickle cell patient. Think about it. Does that make you worry? Does that make you 
disturb you? Does it make you feel like, oh, this is not what I expect? Does it make you look at it again? Clotomycin, right? For somebody who has strep, he has penicillin allergy. And I have digoxin for somebody who is anorexia for 24 hours. Does something ring in your head, buzz in your head? You say, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. I got to like, no, this is not what I expect. This is what should worry me. This should worry me. This should worry me most. Uh, I'll give you the answer for no one. I got to go back later. Which, which should worry me most? And I, like I told you, divide it into two. When you divide it into two and you break it down, you can see what is the treatment of Kawasaki. We give them immunoglobulin. Good luck. Enjoy. I save you, four-year-old. Sickle cell, they're going to have a lot of pain. What do we do? IV, more hydromorphine. You can give them PCA. Excellent. You're doing well. If you put them on acetaminophen, yeah, I will question that. Why is it the sickle cell patient on acetaminophen? Negative. You got to give this patient what? IV, uh, narcotic. You have pneumonia. You have penicillin allergy. I'm not giving you penicillin. I give you another antibiotic. Good luck with that, right? That's good, right? Then you have the joxin, right? And you've anorexia for 24 hours. A key, when you're taking the joxin, number one symptoms is GI. This patient is anorexia. It's a GI problem. But right. we've already eliminated one, two, three. Test the king strategy. I eliminated this. I eliminated these three did not surprise me. You have to pick number four. Even if you don't understand it, pick it. It's a test the king strategy. I've eliminated one, two, three. There's no way I'll go back and overguess myself. I know they're wrong. The joxin, you have to master it for your board. And the way I do it, I just draw my caricature, and I say, start from the head, okay? They have neural problem, okay? Then you go to the eyes. Skin eye changes, scotomas, yeah, right? Then you go to their mouth, GI symptoms, number one. Then you go into their heart, heart block, right? That's why you know these numbers, 90, 70, and 60. If you want to know what they are, check out that 10 class, right? Then their kidney is here. Make sure their kidney function is fine. This is a side effect of the joxin I've given you, apart from making sure potassium, magnesium, calcium, all of them are normal. You see, that is a full lecture on the joxin in one minute. So that's what you have to pay attention to. Therefore, number four is not doing good. You got to intervene. Okay, the joxin toxicity. Okay. So that is the way you can recognize it easily. Um, somebody was asking about number seven. Let me see if I can go back. Yeah, number seven is number four. Number four is the right answer. So four. this is another concept, full lecture, something you should know. They like asking in vaccination. Several clients need vaccination, right? Which client situation need priority intervention? Select and apply. Which one? A typhoid vaccine for a client who receives cefepine, nasal flu vaccine for a client who receives immunoglobulin, or a polio vaccine for a client who is pregnant, rubella vaccine for a client who is on etanocept, and a varicella vaccine for a client who has CD4 count less than 200. All the questions you've done is like a bunch of content, you know, trying to give you in an hour, like it's like condensed in the question form. But like if you hold on to each of the concepts we've discussed, you basically have done a bunch of topics, you know, in a small, simple, straightforward question. So who, which client need priority intervention? Once again, look at it, come up with the buzzword, and then answer the question. See if it surprises you. The buzzword is vaccination. 
And you look at each of them and said, hey, if you on sulfaphine, you should take typhoid vaccine. If you receive immunoglobulin, should you receive nasal flu vaccine? If you're pregnant, should you get oral polio vaccine? If you have etanercept on, should you get rubella vaccine? And you have CD4 count less than 200, which is AIDS, definition of AIDS, should you get varicella vaccine? Guys, this is what the NCLA has been doing. They don't do anything. They, they, they don't making questions from heaven. It's the same concept. And I try to think like them. So it's a selected apply. You don't have to pick all if you know sure about it. The enclaves will want you to pick something you're really, really confident about. Otherwise you lose point. You rather pick things you know rather than guessing. So, but before you answer the question, when you see that test taking strategy, that's what I would teach you if you come to the adapt and close review. Um, the key is break down and say, why are they asking me about vaccination? Is something wrong, right? Why? That should, something should ring in your ear saying, there have to be a contraindication about it. If the enclave is asking you about a vaccine for a patient, Please don't answer the question without no sitting down. One second or two seconds and said, they're trying to trap me. The reason why they give me this vaccine is my buzzword. And what is the buzzword telling me? They want to know if you can give the vaccine to these people. That means contraindication. They're not going to set it down unless they tell you if the age group they're supposed to receive. High for vaccine, you should not give it to somebody who receives cefepine. You have to wait for six months, right? Immunoglobulin make you immunocompromised. You should not get a live vaccine. Nasal flu vaccine is a live vaccine, okay? The IV one, the IM one is not a live vaccine. So this person too is a problem. Pregnant lady is immunocompromised. What is the problem? This is why I said, divide it into two, look at the situation and jump. Pregnant lady, should he get a live vaccine? Negative. A tanercept will make you immunocompromised. This is another immunomodulators we use in Crohn's patient. If you need it, adapt and cut. Rubella is a live vaccine. CD4 count less than 200, you have AIDS. Immunocompromised, you should not get varicella vaccine. All of them are, we got to intervene. All of them are problem. You see guys, all of them are problem. If you get four out of five is good. If you get two out of five is good. If you get one out of five, it's fine. You get something, but don't over select. But I know you know more than that because she listened to adapt and class. So you should be able to get all of them right. All of them is contraindicated in individual. These are one of the common live vaccines that you should know, okay? The rotavirus vaccines are so like that. So now another patient, 10 year old client present to the um, pediatric clinic who need immediate intervention. Same thing, same day, they all have diarrhea. This is what I was I started doing from the beginning. I'm trying to let you be sharp. Look for breathing, sepsis, airway, shock, and everything. And if all of them have a breathing problem, then look at the diagnosis and see who is really sick in the situation. They all have diarrhea. They've been having diarrhea for two days, right? Now, this is your problem. Which buzzword make you worry? There's a reason why I make a big deal out of this because I'm a physician. Sorry, guys, I don't like boasting, but, and this is what we listen to, buzzwords, okay? Buzzwords, dry mucous memory, capillary refill greater than three seconds. I guess I spelled this wrong. And your heart rate is 105 and you're lethargic. Which of these four is like, oh my God, when I see this, you get worried. Which of these four? Which of these four you should worry about? They all have what? It's been two days since they've been having diarrhea. 
but it's for symptoms. You have to be sharp. You have one second, a lethargy patient, a heart rate of 105, and a capillary refill greater than three seconds, and your mucous memory is dry, please, who do you think oh, is more dangerous, is sick? Who? Who is sick? Who is sick? Who is sick? When you pick the right answer, that means you're being sharp. Okay, if you pick a wrong answer, that means we got to work on it. Okay, that means you, uh, you're getting distracted by other things, right? And that's what we have to work on. Dry mucous memory, yeah, dehydration, right? Capillary refill, greater than three seconds. You're good, you're not even dehydrated. You have normal heart rate, dehydration. But if you, lethargy, dehydration. I have three dehydration. Who is in extreme? There's different kind of dehydration. It's mild, moderate, and severe. When you have neurological problem from dehydration, you are severe. Therefore, lethargy is in the buzzwords of B sharp. I told you the R in it is called lethargic. That means neurologically, you are not there. Tachycardia, yeah, you are in shock. But to be lethargic, you pass the shock stage. You just are basically gone. So number four is your right answer. Okay, but they all have dehydration. They all have dehydration. So, I guess uh, we have a few more minutes. Um, this is supposed to be an hour. I think uh, it's 10 more minutes. I hope you bear with me. And this is caring for four clients in the med side unit. Unless you want me to keep going. Which client situation need priority intervention? Same thing. They all have BMP. I want you to focus. I'm using these traps the anchors use on you to let you know about this BMP, right? 200, 300, 109, 900, right? Leg edema, weight gain, right? In two days, four pounds, pink fruit of sputum, and weight gain, seven pounds. And the question is designed to teach you something. I don't set questions just like that to make videos. Like, I want to teach you something from this question. There's a concept I want you to know. If you know it, you can type it. That is a concept this question is teaching. Okay, it's teaching you specifically concept that you should know. So who is a priority intervention? Who is a priority? I can tell you. There's a BMP. When you see that, think about heart failure. And the definition is greater than 100. So that means this patient is heart failure. So you can change this to heart failure, a test taking strategy. BMP greater than 200, I put heart failure here. 105, I put heart failure here. 900, I put heart failure here. Then I go here. Heart failure, you have leg edema. Good luck with that. Heart failure, you gain four pounds in two days. Definition of heart failure. Heart failure with pink fruit sputum, badness. Heart failure, seven pounds. Therefore, this as a pulmonary symptoms is like drowning. So heart failure with the pink fruit sputum is more dangerous than just having leg edema or gaining too much weight in this. We've all in heart failure, but if I start having pulmonary symptoms, I'm in trouble. So number three is more dangerous than all of them. It's, it's in trouble. Four is an exacerbation of heart failure. Five, and, and three, two is exacerbation of it. But they, uh, they, they still probably stable because their lung function is not being affected yet. And I wanted to teach you that BMP is just a normal. It does not help. You can have BMP 1,000, 
it does not matter. It's what your symptoms are, right? 900 of BMP, but this one has 105. It's, it has a long problem. So it's more dangerous than that. It's the same thing, right? We all have fever. GI questions on prioritization, don't let them trap you. They will do that. What the question on the board, you can see it's the same thing in the anklets. They will just change something because I know how they think now. They can put things together, in the GI symptoms, just to trap you. I know the buzzwords they will be using. And so that's why I put it there. You have right upper quadrant pain and you have temperature and your white can is that. Left lower quadrant pain, you have temperature, you have inflammation around the sigmoid. You have right lower quadrant pain, you have a tachycardia, and you have this, right? You have what? Mid epigastric pain, you have temperature, you have amylase, and you have long crackles. Who is more dangerous? Who is in trouble? Who is in trouble? Tell me. Find the diagnosis and look at the situation and see who is in trouble. And then when you make a diagnosis, you can see that, oh, this disease process is dangerous. It's our concept, guys. I don't hide anything. I just try to like make a question so that I can show you how you can learn from it. Right up for quadrant pain. If I draw the abdomen, right up for quadrant pain is here. There's only one thing that is here. That's your gallbladder and your liver, right? So your gallbladder is here, you have fever, and your white count. You have cholecystitis. Cholecystitis is an hiatus. I expect fever, infection. I expect white count. Patient is not sick. I've never said he's in shock or anything like that. Your blood pressure is not dropping. If you have cholecystitis, you should get pain. Cholecystitis, you can get fever. Cholecystitis, your white can can go up. It does not matter whether it's 20,000, 1 million, 500 million, it does not matter. Left lower quadrant pain is here. There's only one thing your board will ask you, sigmoid, right? If you have sig diverticulitis, you're going to have fever. There's going to be inflammation around the sigmoid. It's okay. Right lower quadrant. The only thing your board will ask you is a topic pregnancy or appendicitis is here. You're going to have what? Tachycardia, a temperature of that, right? Because it's appendicitis, fever. And your white count is that. The only time you worry about that is when they say the pain is completely resolved, complete resolution. Yeah, that means they perforate it. But now, yes, right lower quadrant pain, temperature of 102 and Y count, hey, good luck with that. What is the mid epigastric? Your stomach or the pancreas is sitting here like that. They have fever, yeah, high this. I'm less, thousand, your diagnosis of pancreatitis. But when your lung is affected, look at all of this. Their problem is staying in the, in the abdomen. Now this guy's problem is in the lung now. Crackles is in ARDS. That is not good. It's, it's, this is what I said, be sharp and not expected. And if he surprises you, A, it's your answer. Don't worry, don't pick something that you feel you, is more comfortable for you. One, two, three is what I expected. Four, A, I saw a bunch of expected findings. This, this, this. But when your lung is affected, A, A, it's not supposed to be there. So that's your answer choice. Your lung is not supposed to be there. So number four is the right answer. Number, number four, client, well, four clients are in the emergency room. This is the same thing. Now I give you the words. The first one, I did not give you the words. I give you the words and you can, you can use the same strategy. Which client situation need the priority intervention? Appendicitis. Pain at the McBurney's point, a white count of 20,000. Cholocystitis, right upper quadrant pain, temperature of 102. Appendicitis, temperature of 102, sudden resolution of the right lower quadrant. 
cholecystitis, Murphy sign, and the temperature of one or two. This is the same thing. I'm trying to teach you more so that you can, if they don't give you words, they will just describe it. But I've given you the answer choice in the previous question because I know that's the way they will set it. So I've given you the answer already. You can see, right? You can see that appendicitis and itis, you're supposed to have pain in the McBurney's point. That's the distance anterior spear, iliac spine, and the umbilicus right here. And your Y count is that. It's okay. Cholecystitis, you're going to have right upper current pain. You're going to have fever. Appendicitis, same thing, but if your pain, the word is sudden resolution, there's an abscess. Cholecystitis, the pain on the right upper quadrant is called Murphy sign. So that means you have pain with inspiration, arrest, and the temperature of that. It's an expected finding. This pain is gone. You shouldn't have no pain. You should have pain no matter what. If I give you pain medication, I know some people say appendicitis, don't give them pain medication. That's not true. You can give them pain medication without any problem. The pain is not going to go away. It's a peritonitis, it's inflammation. No matter how much pain you give them, just for comfort, it helps with your brain. You know, the receptors in your brain will take it and say, oh, I'm getting some pain medication, but the pain will never go away. So whoever told you, somebody tell you that appendicitis, you should not give them pain medication, it's just wrong. You can still give pain medication, but that, that pain will never go away. The pain goes away when it rupture because of the pressure. So, so give them pain, make them comfortable, right? Everybody, you can give them pain. You can give them morphine. We give them morphine all the time. We give them morphine all the time. Clinically, we give them morphine. The pain is not going to go away. Give them morphine, it will be fine. If you go to the ER right now and you have appendicitis, guess what? You're going to get some pain medication. You're going to get morphine. Pain is not good. It's going to make you comfortable. It does not take away the pain. Number 14, the client with AFib present to the cardi cardiology clinic for follow-up. Which clinical situation need priority intervention? I want to teach you something about Mildron so that when you see it, you know, like you have to be sharp body and what does that mean p clone okay if you're on a mutron you got to worry about being cloned to death otherwise you get into trouble yeah this is a mutron if you want to know what the acronym is, and you're hearing my voice the first time to subscribe to adapt and plus you know what this is means when you see a mutron every time you see a mutron you write p clone right the p c l o n D. The P is pulmonary fibrosis. C is cardiotoxicity. L is the liver. Liver function test goes up. O, optic problem, neurological problem, E, endocrine, and D is dermatitis. It means if you have P, you're going to be cloned. Your mother is going to make you another baby, right? You'll be dead. So AST of 200 is a liver problem. Don't worry about it. TSH of 10 is hypothyroid, is an endocrine. Don't worry about it. Dry cough, that's number one. If you have P, you're going to be cloned. Blue gray discoloration is dermatitis. So number three is bad. If you have pulmonary fibrosis, you're going to be dead. It's a death sentence because then your lung is completely gone. You're going to need a lung transplant. So that's um, something you have to know about it. That medication is dangerous. That it's a good medication, we use it all the time. So it tells you like anybody on this medication, there's three things the doctor should be doing. They check PFTs, okay? They check LFTs and they check TSH, thyroid function test or TFT to make sure you don't develop all of them. But number one is the pulmonary symptoms. 
This is another concept. Like I said, when I created this question, I wanted to give you like endless, broad, endless idea, like concept flowing around. It's just not just one concept. You see, we go left and right, basically the system, it cover all the systems, um, things you have to know about the systems. Clients, right? Which situation? Intervention. We have PAD, we have PVD, we have PAD and PVD. I just want you to know things they can trap you. Peripheral vascular disease and a calf pain after walking. Peripheral venous disease and plus three ankle edema. Peripheral vascular disease and leg pain at rest. Peripheral venous disease and a bronze pigmentation of that. The way to remember PAD and PVD is just remember like PAD is a forward flow. Therefore, if blood is not going down, things are not going to be happy. PVD or v, uh, usually they call it vascular disease, chronic venous disease, too much blood there. I don't need it. You don't need any more blood there. You want the blood to go away. PAD has received too much blood. It just, it, it, it doesn't, no, it does not have the blood going down. So symptoms are consistent with ischemia. It's a demand ischemia. Another way to think about it, a PAD patient is like somebody is having heart attack, less blood flow going to the leg and blood flow in the dependent position. So who you need to see? Who do you need to see? And you have to be smart. Who do you need to see? Think about it. Who do I need to see? PAD patient, calf pain after walking. That is claudication. It's an expected finding. Don't worry about it. PVD, blood is pulling in your leg. It's going to escape to the tissue. You're going to have edema. Don't worry about it, an expected finding. Like I said, go for the expected finding. If it's expected and it does not surprise you, say hallelujah and move on. PAD, leg pain at rest. I know you're going to have pain when you walk, but when you have pain, stop and proceed. This is the reason why I want to keep your leg down, dangle your feet rather than elevate it. But when you're sitting down, you're not moving and you have pain, this is the same. I want you to think critical thinking is the same as heart problem, right? Am I? We have unstable angina and the stable angina. Unstable means what? It's unpredictable and they have pain at rest. Stable angina is pain with exertion. This is stable angina, number one. When you walk, you have pain, it's a form of stable angina. You triggering a demand ischemia. If somebody have not explained it to you that way, this is today, that's what came into my mind. So right now, two seconds, I feel like you gotta get that um, lecture right now. So if the, you, you have unstable angina, you have pain and rest. We don't know when it's going to happen. You don't even have to exert yourself. That is what this guy is doing. Pain at rest, it's an ischemia. The leg is dying. But pain when you walk is stable, angina is predictable. When you exert yourself, this patient is dangerous. PVD, too much blood there is going to escape into the skin. The skin will have hemosiderin deposit. And that is the what? The bronze pigmentation you see. So four is expected, two is expected, one is expected. But number three is not, he has a demand ischemia, not related to don't do anything. He's just sitting there and he has pain. A rest pain is bad for PAD. So four is your right answer. Rest pain is bad. And this one, I just want to like, get you out, go to your pharmacologist, out. Like I told you, this prioritization, whenever I do them, I just like have a bunch of concepts put together. And this is caring for the following client. Which client situation need immediate intervention? 
which client is situation. Divide them, okay? Divide them into two. Look at the situation, if it matches, right? You have CHF, you're on the joxin, your magnesium is one. You have chronic kidney disease, you're on apotin, your hemoglobin is eight. You have schizophrenia, you're on clozapine, your white count is 5,000. You have asthma, you have abodro, potassium is that. You have hypertension and your perineal, and this is that. You have hypertension, you have clotiridone, and your glucose is that. You have hyperlipidemia, you're on orthopostatin, and your CK is 20,000. Select and apply. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them, seven points. I don't know, there may be only one answer there or two. If you know it, just pick it. If you know, don't let it go. But you got to pick something. Which one are you going to pick? Which one? There's a bunch of them who need intervention. Who do you think is worrisome? Who do you think is worrisome? I know digoxin, you know, don't forget magnesium and calcium. These things, keep them normal. Magnesium is one, yeah, I'm worried about it. It will be toxic. You have kidney problem. You're not going to make apotin to make hemoglobin. So you have chronic anemia, that's fine. If I'm treating you, I give you apotin, your hemoglobin is going to go up. So I'm fine with it. Despite hemoglobin of eight, I'm treating you. You have chronic kidney disease, I give you, I put you on apotin because your hemoglobin is eight. It's going to do its job. You have schizophrenia, you're on clozapine, right? I know agranulocytosis, but this is normal, 5,000. Agranulocytosis is less than 250. Sometimes some people with 2,500, right? This is 5,000, it's good. Asthma patient is on abodrol. Potassium is 3.5, you know? Abodrol is going to push the potassium inside you will go low and worry about it. Even though it look normal, it's too low normal. So this may go down. Unlike this, this one, a perineal is a potassium sparing. The potassium you see is going to go up anyway, so I'm not worried about it. But I'll tell you, Don, I mean, that is the side effect. It's the common side effect of uh, um, hydrocortisite derivative. But I expect this to be what it's supposed to be. Starting and your CK is 2,000, 20,000, you have muscle death. This is rhabdomyolysis. So we have 147 at your possible right answers. If four is a little bit, I mean, you're not sure, yeah, it's fine. And it can go either way. But Abudra is going to drive potassium inside the cell. Um, it's going to make it more hypokalemic. That's why we use abuterol to treat hyperkalemia. So I know you see 3.5 is normal, but I'm giving you abuterol, it's going to drop it. So I, I just have to question it a little bit. So that's, but if you're not comfortable, don't pick it, you know? I don't want you to pick it because there's too many answers. So if I, if I pick one and seven, would I get two markets? Uh, so if you pick one and seven, yeah, you get you get two points, two out of three, excellent. So you don't lose a point. But if you pick one more and you get it wrong, you get the one over three. There's three answers there. So the final answer is final answer is three answers. If you pick more than three, you're losing a point. So the final answer, let me see, what was it? Let me, it's number one. Number four and that. So if you pick two and you get two of them right, you get two out of three. 
If you pick all the three, you get three out of three. If you pick five, you put, and you never, you most likely you get zero because, or you get one probably, it will cancel out. You know, two of them will cancel out if you get them right. So don't overpick them, don't over select. If they give you, don't pick too much. Yeah, so if you're right, you get two points. You get two points rather than losing more points. Don't lose what you gain, you know, just keep what you, what you have, you gain and keep moving forward in your test. And this is caring for the following client. Which client situation need immediate intervention? This is now I'm putting everything together. You've seen these answer choices already, but when I put them together like that, and this is no select or apply, you're supposed to pick one answer, right? One answer, because there's no select or apply. But you've seen some of these answers, now I put them in a different category now. What do you think? If somebody said, teach more about atovostatin. Yeah, atovostatin, okay, so let me do this. So it's a starting, okay? Starting, and then I'll just give you this HMG. If you want to learn more, you come to Adapt and Class Review, HMG code A. Reductase inhibitors. This is the enzyme that break it down. Okay. The side effect of starting, all you need to do is to write this down. Okay. They're going to age is the liver problem. Don't worry about it. It affects the liver. Don't worry about it. M is a myopathy. Worry about it. Muscle is myopathy. So this is check. G, the glucose is going to go up. Don't worry about it. C is a CK. Worry about it. It's going to go up. This is another one. O, don't worry about it. A is related to elevating elevation of glucose. Um, and it's a little bit of teratogenic in pregnancy. You may have to worry about it a little bit. So this is pregnancy elevated. Pregnant lady shouldn't take it. R is the rhabdo. Okay, rhabdo. This you worry about it. And I is the glucose, elevated glucose again. So when they give you starting, you're looking for myopathy, you're looking for CK, you're looking whether the patient is pregnant, and you're looking for rhabdo. That's all. So that's the, that's why they answer. This is the side effect of, and of course you take it at night because that's what. Um, you need to do, that's where cholesterol is made at night. So you take it at night um, before you go to bed, right? That's all, that's everything about statins, okay? And then, well, somebody, I don't want to do lectures, like you said, but remember they can give you RDL, HDL, um, triglyceride and cholesterol, okay? This one, you want to keep it less than 100. This one, you want to let it go more than 50 IAB. Triglyceride, you want to get it less than 150. And cholesterol, 200. They will trap you, okay? They will say, they will give you a patient with the, these numbers are very high. And they will tell you, you give the patient medication and two months later, the numbers are not, this is where you want it to be, but it's going down. Yes, don't change anything. So far as it's going down, it's okay. So far as it's going down, you don't jump from the cholesterol of 500 to 200 in two months, slowly, slowly. So, so far as the numbers are going down, I'm good with that. But if it's going up yeah, then you gotta change the medication. You just keep the patient on the medication. That's all, short lecture on starting, right? So this one said pick one. Pick one, okay? You said pick one, pick one, because there's no Saturday. So you gotta pick one. And I told you, divide it into two to make life easier, right? CHF, what do I see? A BMP greater than 100 is CHF. If you have more than 25,000, is the definition of BMP, CHF. Don't worry about it. 
If you're getting blood transfusion and your temperature is 100, this is not transfusion reaction. You have to know the difference between them. I have video in, a, in my channel where I talk about all the transfusion reactions, you know, the uh, fibro non hemolytic allergic reaction and then a hemolytic reaction. There's different, there's a classic way. Your board will confuse you. The most common is the fibro non hemolytic. That's what this guy is doing. The most common thing when you transfuse a patient with blood, the temperature goes up. If I want it to be emulatic reaction, I have to give you chest pain. I have to give you dark urine. Those are classic for emulatic. If I want to give you anaphylactic, I'm going to give you bronchospasm or what? Airway issue or a rash on their skin, they is different. If I want you to worry about taco and trailer, I will tell you about pulmonary edema, flash. Look, check adapting class. I have some videos there. They describe all the five types of, so this guy is fine. He just have non emulatic Beta blocker and your heart rate is 61A. It's not abnormal. So that's good, right? So this guy is good, this is good. Isonizide, what is the side effect? Tingliness and numbness of your feet. That's why you give them B6, right? Vitamin B6. I told you this video is made up of a bunch of concepts. Therefore you left it one, at least one question has to be. Pericarditis with the narrow pulse pressure is bad, means your blood pressure is 120 over 110. It's not normal. There is no pressure between the systolic and diastolic. It's because the patient has constrictive pericarditis. So this is your right answer. This one is hard one, but um, if you get it, good. You're doing great. If you do not, um, just work on it and just keep on, keep on it. I keep, I say keep charging. That's what I mean. Keep charging at it and there's, you just get a concept right. And when you see the answer question, you can, it will just pop out to you like candy. I say that all the time. I'm not joking. You know, it's like, um, it's because I see the concept. And so this is what he's trying to ask. A few more then with that. A nurse is caring for a following client. Which client situation needs? immediate intervention. This one is a selected apply. So there may be more than one answer choice there, right? There may be more than one answer choice there. You're on isosorbide. I tell you, divide it in two. And I give you a talidophil for erectile dysfunction. You take warfarin and I give you sucrophate for your peptic ulcer disease. This is the, you see the way I'm reading it if you read prioritization like that, it makes sense. But when you read the way they, they, they give it to you, it does not make sense. Digoxin, and I give you nephedipine for your bra pressure. Provozamine, and I prescribe sumatotriptan um, for your migraine. You're on lithium, I prescribe respiridone for your maniac. So see if the three things I've underlined for each of them, if it's something should disturb you, if it doesn't, then let it go, right? It's a selector apply. If you already know one, just pick one. Don't overguess it, right? If you think there's more than one answer choice there, yeah, pick it. If you think there's more than one answer choice there. Some of these questions I add. So if you're fumbling, no, don't, I mean, it, it means like we got to do some more work, but they add questions. I, um, the enclaves will make it easier for you. So if you're solving them, I mean, you're doing great. Now, isosorbide is a nitrate. 
If you take the fuels for nitrate, no, wrong. I'm, we, have, we have a problem. When you take nitrate, you don't take the fuels, right? I said, don't take the fuels. Warfarin, yeah, for your anticoagulation. The sucrophate is a cement. When you take cement, you shouldn't take any medication and you also affect absorption of that. Digoxin, right? You should avoid calcium channel blockers, right? SSRI, right? You should not take serotonin derivative, sumatriptan, bad. If you take lithium, yeah, we can give you a second generation antipsychotic, no problem for the amniac. So one, two, three, and four are your right answers. Those are bad. So one, two, three, four, we got to intervene. There's four answers, like I said, if you only know one, yeah, that's fine, minute back. I know you should know more than one. You can give um, Respiridon to maniac patient because it's a second generation antipsychotic. We can do that. And then um, number 19. And this is caring for the following client. Which client situation need immediate intervention? The same thing, right? Appendicitis, cholecystitis, pancreatitis, and diverticulitis. Pancreatitis, and appendicitis with your pain is nine out of 10. Cholecystitis, you have one or two temperatures. Pancreatitis, you have abdominal distension. And diverticulitis, you have abdominal rigidity. I'm giving you the adapt and close B sharp buzzways. You know, there's buzzways there. So they are IDs, GI problem, right? One has pain. If there's a hiatus there, there's pain. If there's hiatus there, it's supposed to be fever. Pancreatitis, you get this tension. Rigidity is a buzzword for sepsis. It's a buzzword for sepsis. These are the ways you look for when they give you abdominal problems. So abdomen on the B-sharp for sepsis, okay? When I say sepsis, this is what I mean in the B-sharp. You should watch the B-sharp video. It talks about what? Rebound tenderness. Diffused abdominal tenderness, rigidity, garden. These are big words when you see, or they can say uh, peritonitis. Don't use the word peritonitis, I know. But this is where, what do you, when you see that, that's bad. So those are signs of uh, peritonitis. And I think the last one, I wasn't planning to stay that long, but hey, this is the last one. And this is this, yeah, I forget the one. There's one, I just saw it, it's on the question. This, and this is caring for the following client. Which client situation need immediate intervention? Select that apply, right? Select all that apply. Diverticulitis, bot like abdomen, pancreatitis, peri umbilical ecchymosis, intersusception, large branch tool, PUD, sudden 10 out of 10 epigastric pain, epidural hematoma, and vomiting. This is just to hand it back. It's a bunch of concepts to hand it. Bunch of concepts to hand it. Bunch of concepts to hand.
bunch of concepts, right? You don't have to pick all of them, but I want you to pick some so that you can get a point. Diverticulitis, right? This is one of the buzzwords, but like guarding, rebound tennis, tenderness, um, they are all signs of peritonitis, rigidity, but like abdomen, it's like a burn. Yeah, this is a problem. Pancreatitis, periambulical ecchymosis, there's two. These umbilicals, you can get bruises here, and can get bruises here. That is bad. This patient is bleeding, B sharp moment. This is sepsis, this is bleeding, periambulical, this is curling sign. That's bad. It's a bad way. Intersusception. This is what I said. You have to be sharp, not expected. What do you expect in a patient who is not having intersusception? He's going to have brown stool. If they are going to have intersusception, they're going to have mucoid stool mixed with what? Blood. That tells you they have intersusception, they have ischemia. This patient has a large brown stool. It does not have ischemia. That means the intersusception has resolved. This is exactly what I mean when I say be sharp, not expected. This is what I expect in somebody who is doing well in interception. If you get mucus and mix with stool, I know you're getting into trouble. You have ischemia. This patient, don't worry about him. Peptic ulcer disease, sudden, bad word, 10 out of 10, mid epigastrin is perforated. Epidural hematoma, when you're vomiting, brain injury, vomiting is also bad. So one, two, four, and five are your right answers. Guys, this is the end of the road. This is the end of the road. So, like I said, if um, you need some help, just um, join us. Um, join us on, um, we, we have a review coming up. And then if you have problem pain, just let me know. Um, it's very loaded. This is everything pharmacology is included. I mean, you will not find anything anywhere. Of course, you can't be free. You know, I get a bunch of email that you want it to be free. There's no way I can do this free. Sorry. <laughs> but <laughs> this time commitment is like, I hear fact, if you calculate, it's less than like $15 uh, per subject. So um, thank you very much for watching. And uh, good luck. All the best of you. Okay, so I'll see you guys later. Just email me if you're interested and then good luck. Happy New Year, everybody. And I say, if you can pay, I mean, just, um, you have any problem paying, just email me. We'll work something out. Um, we can talk, but just email me. Goodbye. Okay,